Hello, welcome to Right City. This is the final day of our annual conference. Thank you everyone for joining us wherever you are. This event is organized in partnership, uh, in partnership with the um, Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, the Department of National Defense, the University of Ottawa's Human Rights Research and Education Center, the Embassy of the Netherlands, GAMAC, and the US Embassy. And it's also under the patronage of uh, the, the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. So thank you to all our partners for this final session on confronting online hate speech. I'm very happy to give the floor to Naomi Kikola, who is a long friend of MIGS and a Canadian who's still in the US, but we hope that you'll be able to join us soon. Now, Naomi, the, uh, the floor is yours. Marie, thank you so much. Uh, it's a real honor to be able to be with you. And I'd like to thank the Montreal Institute for Genocide Studies and the Royal Wallenberg Center for Human Rights and all of the hosts for holding this really timely conference. For those who are marking Juneteenth, I wish you a very meaningful day. Uh, I'd like to just start by saying that we're going to be discussing one of the most pressing challenges of the modern human rights movement, how to confront online hate speech. Emerging technologies, including social media, have in many ways revolutionized the promotion and protection of human rights. But with their emergence comes the potential to do harm. We've seen technological innovations outpace our ability to study their impact or to develop legal regimes and monitoring mechanisms to help mitigate against possible harms, especially when it comes to hate speech. For this conversation, we're gonna focus on a subset of speech as it relates to the incitement and commission of mass atrocity crimes and to conflict. In the past decade, there's been growing recognition, including from the United Nations strategy and plan of action on hate speech, that such speech is often a precursor to atrocity crimes. And as the previous UN Special Advisor on the Prevention of Genocide has noted, online hate speech can fuel polarization both on and offline. In 2017, he reported that inflammatory rhetoric and stereotyping on social media preceded violence against ethnic and political groups in South Sudan. That is a pattern that we've unfortunately seen now in a number of countries. The question then becomes, how can we confront it? And in a manner that doesn't have unintended impacts, such as violating freedom of expression and other digital rights. There's much that we do not know, including about the causal dynamic between speech and the actual commission of crimes and violence. But given the severity of the risk, it would seem that the onus should be on the creators of these tools and of the possible social harms to find solutions. Are they responding accordingly? Self-regulation may work in some settings with certain corporate actors, but where does responsibility lie and what tools exist to international, national, corporate and civil society actors to regulate, monitor and mitigate the harms of online technology, notably social media? I'm gonna to turn to our panelists to ask each of them to share their perspective on how to confront online hate speech, particularly in the context of conflict and mass atrocity prevention. Each will speak for about five minutes. Uh, we're incredibly fortunate to have Silvia Fernandez de Gramendi, the chair of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity Crimes, and also former judge and president of the International Criminal Court, join us. I'd like to ask you to start, Silvia. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for this uh, great introduction for, to our topic uh, today. Uh, indeed, uh, I am here in my capacity of chair of the Global Action Against Mass Atrocity, GAMAC. Uh, which I, uh, I would like to, to uh, indicate. It is a global and inclusive network of states, civil society, and academic institutions that aim to support states in establishing national architectures and policies for the early and permanent prevention of atrocities. Now, uh, GAMAC, as a prevention platform composed of states and civil societies on civil society, and uh, 19 partners, uh, including a mix being one of them, uh, this platform is, uh, is, uh, is proposed as a, a space to talk about real issues and to contribute to move from a culture of reaction to a culture of prevention. We know the problem, we are identifying hate speech as a problem, but to how to address it without infringing on other uh, very important rights, as you mentioned, like uh, freedom of expression, is not an easy matter. And who does what and who decides what? Um, we see that, uh, uh, well, of course, hate speech has not, uh, is not an invention of digital technologies, but as you said yourself, this has really introduced new technologies, have really introduced a new dimension to hate speech. 
hate speech, and that's why we, we know it's a precursor of violence, because even before digital technologies, it has been demonstrated by history from the Holocaust to Srebrenica, Rwanda, Myanmar, Cameroon, South Sudan, Burundi, all these, in those, all these areas, hate speech played a huge role. And also, it has also showed that uh, past and recent events have shown that no society is immune to this. At the end of the day, hate speech may generate, but also it's a manifestation. So, uh, of course, if we want to deal with hate speech, we need to address the underlying causes, discrimination, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, attacks against minorities and vulnerable groups. So I will stop here just to say that with Gamma, we think that because this is such a holistic issue that uh, addresses so many questions and no society is immune, we need to have a global approach to it. We cannot just deal with it at the national level. But I've stopped here now. Thank you. I'm going to turn right now to our second panelist, Fernand de Barenas, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. Uh, thank you, Naomi, uh, mesdames et messieurs. Bonjour tout le monde, buenos dias. I'm delighted and honored to be part of this event uh, with such distinguished speakers as Sylvia and Ian. And I'd like to express also my gratitude to all of the organizers for the privilege of taking part with all of you today. Um, I'm especially pleased to have Naomi, the director of the Center for Prevention of Genocide, moderating this panel because I'd like to start with this statement, which I think might have been used at an event held at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum that the genocide we know as the Shoah or Holocaust did not begin with gas chambers. It started with hate speech against a minority. The Nazis effectively used propaganda to win the support of millions of Germans to facilitate persecution, war, and ultimately genocide of, well, mainly Jewish and Roma minorities. So let me start with a provocative warning. Social media pla platforms now amplify intolerance and prejudice and allow thousands of little Joseph Goebbels to spew propaganda of hate and racism, reaching almost immediately huge numbers of people around the world, but causing also real harm, literally leading individuals around the world being vilified, pointed out, lined up, lynched and massacred because they belong to dehumanized others, usually. Usually overwhelmingly targeting minorities. The data available in some countries suggest that three quarters, for example, of hate crimes are aimed at minorities. And it seems that it is around the same proportion when we talk of who are those mainly targeted by hate speech. Social media have had a very profitable free run for a long time but the world cannot afford any longer the wild west of propaganda with no strong restrictions. Um, they've profited and we have to say that their business model, essentially in the use of their algorithms, they are, have been able to profit in areas where in fact hate has been propagated. And indeed social media platforms are among the most profitable private enterprises in the world today. But with little or no financial liability or responsibility. This I have suggested needs to be addressed head on. No private business should be immune from the harm and violence which they directly contribute to and can unleash. And we've clearly seen in Myanmar and in Sri Lanka and in countries like Cameroon and other parts of the world that this needs to be done. So earlier it was asked whether we, we should be regulating well, I would say that the time has come to do that. A global regulatory approach, specifically a legally binding treaty, would allow to protect freedom of expression while providing guidelines on the forms of incitement which needs to be regulated and limited, and also tackle the anomaly of social media essentially having no liability for the harm or damage that can be caused by messages that they are used to propagate as a medium. So, of course, I, I'll just end by saying social media must be encouraged and assisted in voluntarily lifting up their game in content moderation systems. They have done so, they are increasingly doing so. 
but their community standards and any oversight or appeal entity should clearly commit to protecting vulnerable and marginalized minorities. These are the ones who are mainly affected by hate speech. These are the ones which all efforts by social media platforms must focus on. And quite frankly, right now, I don't think enough is being done in this regard, particularly because very often, even the word minority is seldom, if ever used, in terms of these various uh, moderation and protection systems. Thank you, Nancy. Ian Levine, a senior human rights advisor uh, at Facebook uh, and a longtime human rights advocate. So very curious to hear from, from you, Ian. Thank you, Naomi, um, and thank you to the organizers of the panel, and thank you to those who've gone before me um, with some really powerful and, and, and thoughtful um, interventions on, on the topic. I'm really happy to be here to give a, a perspective from uh, from the social media company. Um, obviously, this conversation is taking place, um, as others have said, not only in the context of extraordinarily worrying levels of hate speech in, in many conflicts around the world, in, in most cases, uh, as Fernand said, directed against minorities, racial, religious, um, those based on sexual orientation, gender identity, and, and others. But in the context, uh, particularly since the beginning of the, of the COVID uh, epidemic, in which our lives have more and more migrated online and in which we more and more both exercise our human rights to freedom of expression, to access to information, freedom of assembly, health, education, uh, the right to an adequate standard of living uh, online, but we also increasingly see uh, our human rights violated online through hate speech and misinformation and disinformation and bullying and harassment and, and so many other uh, questions. So. I think it's really important to begin the conversation with the international human rights framework um, uh, in response to many of the issues that have been raised by previous speakers about so many of the, the growing problems that are associated with uh, human rights and social media platforms. We've recently adopted um, a human rights policy, a global uh, a, a human rights policy for Facebook um, around the world, which seeks to clarify our commitments to human rights standards and to set out the ways in which we intend to uphold those standards through due diligence, through remedy, through uh, uh, increased transparency, accountability, governance and oversight. Um, and in that human rights policy, we particularly focus on our responsibilities as a company under the UN guiding principles for business and human rights, a human rights treaty, which is coincidentally 10 years old uh, this week, 10 years since it was approved and endorsed by the UN Human Rights Council, as well as other critical human rights standards that help to both protect freedom of expression, um, as set out in the ICCPR uh, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, but also critical human rights standards that seek to protect uh, the fundamental principles of equality and non-discrimination. And for that reason, we specifically uh, call out the importance of the Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, as well as the Convention on the Rights of the Child and the Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. How do we enforce, how do we try and ensure that we live up to our commitment not to allow hate speech on the platform? And as Fernand said, we don't always get it right. Uh, 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 and, and, and there's still a long way to go. And we do this in two ways. We do it through automated enforcement and we do it through human, human content moderation. Um, about 97% of hate speech on the platform is removed uh, automatically. It's removed through, through algorithms, through classifiers. Um, uh, in the first quarter of 2021, something like 25 million pieces of content were removed uh, because th th they are, they are uh, hate, hate speech. Um, other content is removed by, by human content moderators following complaints that are, are, are made by, by users, where users flag that content for, for it to be used. We have moved forward. We are learning lessons. And if you look at what's been going on since the coup uh, uh, on, on February the 1st, 2021, 20, which is leading, obviously, to, 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 to massive uh, human rights violations. But if you look at the way in which the social media companies have responded to that, I think you can see that we, we are learning lessons and we are finding ways to ensure that we respond in a much more rights-respecting way. And, I, and, and one, just one action I, I want to highlight, which I think is really important, is that shortly after the coup, um, Facebook removed 
the the Tatmadaw, the Myanmar military, from 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 the platform, precisely for human rights reasons. And we did so by citing the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to justify our decision, to justify our decision, uh, because we felt that that was essential in order to keep uh, uh, the Myanmar people safe and as much as possible to protect their freedom of, of expression on the platform. Thank you so much for that, Ian. Uh, and I think we'll share the link to uh, Defy Hate Now. Um, I think we'll also share a link at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum. We um, produce uh, annually an early warning list of countries that are at risk of mass killing. And it's something that we um, do brief social media companies on to try to address uh, the gap that Benan mentioned around, especially the vulnerabilities facing minorities. I wanted to pose the question um, from Ben Mosher, who's viewing, uh, around how does the transnational nature of social media affect the accountability process? I think I, maybe I should go backtrack a little bit and say, when we talk about social media, we are talking about a global phenomenon, obviously. Uh, national borders really cannot limit, or very diff with very difficulty, cannot limit uh, 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 social media anymore. So therefore, obviously, the challenge of hate speech is a global uh, challenge and therefore has to find a, a global approach to address it. And the global approach has to be one on, which balances two things. One, freedom of expression has to be the first uh, main area of protection of a global approach. Identifying freedom of expression is, is not really that difficult. We know pretty well, we know what it is. However, the, the permissible limits to freedom of expression uh, in international human, human rights law, as we heard earlier from Sylvia and Ian, is much more difficult to define. We do have a few tools, such as the Rabat principle, which I myself and Ian have referred to. And I think what needs to be done is a global approach so that we can deal with really what is a global uh, um, challenge and uh, difficulty. And that would require, therefore, engaging not only states in today's world with social media, but obviously the social media platform owners themselves. And I would suggest uh, social uh, uh, civil society organizations and minority organizations as such. There is now uh, an increasing uh, uh, political will to address the problem. Uh, the fact that we are all talking about hate speech and the need to address the problem and within the UN and within regional uh, organizations and in general, I think there is this political will. And, and also there is an increasing political will at the national level to to address the problem. But indeed, as it has been just said now by Fernand again, it, this is a global problem. So you cannot just deal with it at the national level. Because uh, when you are talking about accountability process, and the, of course the global, uh, the global nature of the problem, of course it affects the accountability process. Who is going to repress? who is going to do it and how, because we are talking about a global phenomenon. Where, where is this, where is, what is the origin of this hate speech? It, it is most of the times it goes beyond national borders. So who is responsible to regulate and repress and how? So you do need to have some kind of, uh, of, of legal international framework to ensure cooperation, but also to agree on who is, uh, uh, who is liable and before whom. So um, if uh, going back to the question, is there a political will for this? Well, we need to start the process. And I think there is an increasing recognition that we need to address the, and, and that there is maybe a, there is a, a, a gap in the regulatory framework. So this regulatory framework doesn't need to be only, as I said, about accountability. But if we go into some kind of accountability, it, it, it needs to be the Define, we need to define hate speech and define who regulates, who represses, and to also uh, uh, provide the tools for cooperation within uh, this uh, legal framework. Do we need a more coherent and coordinated international response to address the protection of human rights online in the digital space? Absolutely. Do we need the UN Human Rights Council to focus more on how we protect rights 
um, online and how we protect people from harmful speech and, 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 and content online in the real world? Absolutely. Um, do we need more conceptual work to develop an understanding of how the Rabat principles apply in different places and ensure that they're, 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 they're used more effectively? Um, do we need to do more work on accountability uh, for governments and for non-state actors and for companies around uh, uh, hate speech and uh, other speech that, that causes harm? Um, absolutely. Um, are we going to see the not just the political will, but the, the glo a global consensus to create an accepted a widely accepted set of standards that will find the balance between hate speech and freedom of speech. I'm personally, to be frank, somewhat skeptical. I mean, just looking at the evolution of uh, national level regulations that we're seeing in many parts of the world in, 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 uh, and the ways in which increasingly um, authoritarian governments in particular are using that regulation to repress free speech and to repress minorities and to repress dissent. Um, I, I, would, I would not expect uh, it, it, it to be easy to make progress on, on, a, on one set of international regulations or an international regulation. Um, but obviously, I'm very keen to see the international human rights system grapple more and engage more with the social media companies. Uh, and there are some very good initiatives ongoing, good conversations, important uh, fora for these uh, conversations to take place. Um, um, I, I, I think at least in the short term, we're going to see more progress through some of those mechanisms that, than, than maybe um, what's being proposed, but, but fascinated to see how the discussions might evolve. Thank you so much for that, Ian. And I want to thank uh, Sylvia, Fernand, and Ian, Ian all for participating in uh, the conversation. I think the the various elements that we touched on shows just how incredibly challenging uh, this issue is, but also just the urgency of the situation, the severity of the crimes that are uh, potentially at risk, uh, the fact that we've seen uh, how social media can amplify hate, uh, can play a critical role in uh, the speed at which crimes are occurring and conflict unfolds uh, and the harm that is committed really does kind of underscore the, the need to address uh, these issues. And as Fernand said, not enough is now being done. Um, it really is a multi-sectoral issue. This is not something that can be completely within the purview of the social media companies, national governments, um, entities like the United Nations or civil society. Everyone has a, a role to play, including ourselves, uh, improving our own media literacy Thank you all for taking the time to, to join us and a very big thank you to the Montreal Institute for Genocide Studies and the Rural Wallenberg Center. Thank you, Naomi. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, I think this is a great conversation. We're gonna learn from it. And I just wanna tell everyone watching, um, please, if you don't know about GAMAC, Global Action Against Mass Hashi Crimes, they're having their major conference. Um, it's gonna be online this year in November, and it's focusing on hate speech, both online and offline. So look that up, and we hope to continue having this important conversation. Thank you for joining us at Bright City. Thank you.